Chris Katie, I'm going to invite you to find your Bible, open it to Ephesians chapter 1 today. We're going to be continuing our sermon series that we began last week entitled Church Reconstructed. If you're a guest of ours, I want to once again thank you for being with us. These have been some exciting days in the life of our church. We've seen folks in recent days not only join our church, but make decisions professing Christ as their Lord. We've seen just in the last month our celebration of five years as a church. It's quite a historic and fun time in the life of our church. And it's also a time that's prompted us to come back as we've grown to come to this question. What is the church? What is the church? Because with the onslaught of the cultural storms taking place, simultaneously seeing some catastrophic collapses of leaders within the church in America, many people have kind of come and said, goodness gracious, it's pretty dark days. There's been some confusion about what the church is and what the church is not. In fact, recently I... uh, connecting with a gentleman who was reconnecting with the church after being away for some time. And I just simply said this. I said, why'd you you leave the church? He said, honestly, Pastor Wesley, here's the deal. Every time I went to church, they either asked for more money or more time so that they could, quote, grow the church. And I was going through some stuff, and they didn't even care. No one ever cared about me. I think we've all to some degree been in that same spot where we can go in and out. We're moving through a, a busy time and we see everyone else is kind of finding them pla- their place, but they're never finding their place to care for us, to care for one another. And what we come as we come to this passage and we see today Paul is showing really how church leaders how they care for the church, how they view the church, really ambitions or goals or better put, aims that church leaders have for the church. And I think in full disclosure and transparency, I want you to see my heart for you and see the heart the church leaders have for you as the church. And there's no better place to walk through this than here in Ephesians chapter 1 today. Ephesians chapter 1 begins... And we saw Paul give that kind of statement of who he was writing to. And then in verse 3, he moves through the second longest sentence in the New Testament. A singular sentence that would make English teachers really upset with the way that he wrote it. And as he writes it, he's unpacking some truth about who God is. How God the Father, before the foundation of the world, established the church, this corporate temple. He predetermined where the boundaries were going to go. Some of your Bibles may use the word predestined, where the the boundaries of the church, the foundation was going to be laid. He spoke about the praise that the son would receive in constructing the Christ, uh, constructing the church, how he would take sinners in the concrete of their sin, rocks encapsulated in that, and he would break us out as these rocks. He would cleanse us off with his blood. He would place us into the church for his glory. He would talk about how the Holy Spirit marked us, identified us about where we would go in this church because it was all part of God's corporate temple that he was building. It displayed God's wisdom to the world. The reason why Paul used this language, if you recall, was because he's writing to a group of Christians there in Ephesus, modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor. And he's writing to them as the backdrop behind them is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. A temple to the false goddess Artemis. This temple was huge. Largest known structure in the, old, in the first century. It was a massive temple. And it took 120 years to build. It was the epicenter of all the commerce, all of the religion, all of the education in the day. This is the backdrop. And Paul uses, as he's writing to the church there in Ephesus, he's writing using this language that's talking about what God has done in contrast to that small little false goddess temple. And what we find is when he does that, he comes And he moves as a transition from that statement in verses 3 through 14 to verse 15 where he says, for this reason or this is why. That's where I want us to pick up 
on our word today, reading the scripture. I want us to pick up in verse 15 because in it, it shows three aims that church leaders have for you. They want you to see three things that there are their goals. They're not hiding some ulterior motive behind you. Instead, they're transparent. And Paul unpacks them right here. And so I'm going to ask if you'd stand as we read God's word, beginning in verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 1. And it says this, This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints... I have never stopped giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the perceptions of your mind may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what is glorious riches of His inheritance among the saints, and here's the third, What is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his vast strength? Paul would go on. He said he demonstrated this power in the Messiah by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. Far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put everything under his feet. And appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body. The fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. Will you pray with me? Father, I pray over our word and our time together that Christ Jesus would be magnified. Lord, I pray that they would see the heart that you have for their church. Heart that leaders have for their church. And Lord, I pray that you alone would receive the glory. Give us your spirit as our guide and our teacher. Give us wisdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As I made mention, Paul comes and he begins this statement here with, for this reason. And the reason why he says, or or this is why, is what some translations would say. The reason why is because he's taking everything that was written in verses 3 through 14, and he's continuing them on, and he's beginning to show you how he views the church, how he views the people there in Ephesus, how leaders view the church. Sometimes how we view the church is not how you might view the church. In fact, I remember when my daughter Addison was in Amy's womb she would be able to Amy would be able to feel her kick and move around and Amy would always try to get me to come over and feel her kick and her move and I never could in fact it was kind of a weird season for me because we would go to the doctor and they would do that ultrasound and they would say in the ultrasound here's your daughter here's how cute she is here's her Head, here's her cute little nose, she's sucking her thumb. And I would look at that, we would take that printed piece home, put it on our refrigerator, people would come into our house, they would ooh and ah, and I would tell them exactly what that sonographer said. Here's her head, here's her little thumb, and she's sucking on it, here's her cute little nose, do you see that? And I would say this over and over, but you know what I really saw? I didn't see it at all, I saw an ink blot. I'm not going to lie, it was like that Pangea thing that they teach you in science class where all the continents come together and I was just trying to figure out what in the world was going on. That's what I saw until Addison was born. And then I held her in my arms, I could look down, I could see her tiny little head, her sweet little tiny nose, and she was, of course, sucking on her thumb. And I saw her and I loved her and I cared for her. When Paul is writing here to the church, what he's doing, he's not looking at some Pangea ink blot stuck upon the refrigerator. He's been in Ephesus for over three years. He knows these people. He sees these people. He's held them in his arms as a spiritual father to them. And he loves and he cares for them. You know what church leaders want you to know? Here's the first thing they want you to know. They care for you. They care for you. You know the old saying, doesn't matter what someone knows, doesn't matter what they know, 
I'll get that thing right. I've got it so goofed up in my head now. It doesn't matter how much someone knows if someone doesn't care for you. We've all been in a spot where someone's had some goals for us, some ambitions for us. They may even be telling us what to do. But behind that question, we want to ask is this. Do they really care for me? Do they really have my best interest in mind? Don't we all agree? And what Paul is saying when he comes here, he's coming and writing here in verse 15 and 16, and he has these people's best interest in mind because he cares for them. And he has a spirit that's not presumptuous. Instead, he has great gratitude for them. Notice with me. Take your eyes to verse 15. For this reason, everything that he just unpacked in verses 3 through 14, for this reason, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and secondly, your love for all the saints, here's his response. I've never stopped giving thanks for you. I've never stopped giving thanks for you. Can you feel this, parents, holding that child in your arms, seeing who they are? You're looking down and you are so grateful for them. That's what Paul is saying. And there's two reasons within these verses why Paul is thankful for them. Notice with me. It's the first is their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he uses the word and to show us the second one. And their love for all the saints. The reason that Paul is grateful for them, thankful for them, the reason why he cares for them is because he's seen their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. i remind you what I shared with you last week. In Acts chapter 19, persecution had come upon the city. Paul had come in. He had preached the same gospel that you and I believe, that apart from Jesus Christ, we have no hope. He preached this message, and many people started to respond by faith, by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. And as a result, it changed the entire economic landscape of the city, of the region. There was a man named Demetrius, who was a silversmith, who did not like this. And so he started, along with others, a riot and persecution broke out to those early believers. Everyone was trying to say, don't speak the gospel. Paul even eventually had to flee the city. But here's what happened. Those believers, those very Jews and Gentiles who had come to believe in Jesus, their hearts had been changed. The stone of their sin had encapsulated them in that concrete, had been cleansed by Jesus. They had been placed into the body of Christ, this temple. When their story began to be told, everyone started to hear what was taking place. And now Paul, as he's writing to this church here in a prison cell, he is hearing the message and he's looking back, holding those little, precious, tiny believers in his arms and he's looking back and he's grateful for them because he cares for them. Church, do you see what the Bible's teaching us here? Paul is grateful. Church leaders are grateful for you because when they look at your life, they see a story that God has divinely written where he took a sinner like you and I and he redeemed us. But sometimes we are quick to tell the story of when we got married. We're quick to tell the story of when we had kids. We're quick to tell the story when we graduated or when we got a new job or when the chiefs won. But we never tell the story of when Christ saved us. Why is that, church? I don't say that to drop a hammer on you. I say to say this. You have amazing stories of what God has done. And the story of our church, the story of what God has done in your life is a story meant to be shared. Share your story. Be, as Paul said, be be grateful for what the Lord has done. But he goes on and he says not only the faith that they've been able to show and demonstrate within this region, but secondly, he says about their love for all the saints. Paul had heard testimony about how these Jews and Gentiles got together and they started to love one another. And remember what I told you last week, born Jews, born Gentiles, two different groups, they were indoctrinated to hate one another. They would have been like Missouri Tigers and Kansas Jayhawks. As our house says, what do Tigers eat? They eat Jayhawks. 
We say that in football season. We don't say it in basketball season. Because we're building this into our kids' mindset. But then when we come to the church, all of that is put to this. Christ has taken born Jews, born Gentiles, those indoctrinated to hate one another, and he in his wisdom has brought them together where the tigers love the Jayhawks and the Jayhawks love the tiger. Is that not a supernatural work of God? And that's what he's saying here. And the word has come that there's a love for, that word right there, three letters, all the saints. All. Paul has heard about the unity that's come. And it made him happy and grateful. Quite honestly, I'm grateful for the unity that we have and we've experienced, but it's not without notice that it comes from a condition that each of us had when we recognize the power and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God's worked in your life. He's taken people that were enemies of one another and enemies of him and he's brought us together. Paul wants you to know. I want you to know. Leaders want you to know this. They care for you. Here's the second. They pray for you. Leaders want you to know they pray for you. Some of you know that your leaders pray for you. Some of you don't know that your leaders pray for you, not in the same way that you want us to. In fact, I'll tell you a quick little story. Whenever I lived in Texas, I was a minister of students in a small church, and my responsibility on Wednesday afternoon was to man the prayer hotline. Now, this was a a landline phone. It was before we had email or text messages. Instead, it was a dial rotary phone that was orange in color that sat in the back of the office there on the desk. And when the phone phone rang, it was my responsibility on Wednesday afternoons to answer the phone, to listen to what the prayer request was, to write it down, and to pray for the person. On one particular day, there was a lady named Veronica. She called, and and I went over just as I would on numerous times when people would call about their their hospital or, or health issues. They would call and want me to pray for their marriage. Like I'm 19 years old praying for someone's marriage. What does a 19 year old know about marriage? I knew nothing, but I prayed for it. But Veronica called on this Wednesday afternoon. I answered the phone, and this is what. Veronica wanted me to pray for. I'm not making this stuff up. Veronica called. She said, I need prayer for my cat, Jules. My cat, Jules, ate my other cat, Holly's food. And she wasn't supposed to have it. And so she ended up getting sick on the floor. My other cat, Tabitha, came in and ate that, you fill in the blank, and she got sick. Now, Holly, the cat whose fancy feast apparently got eaten, is refusing to eat, and Veronica asked that I would pray for wisdom on whether or not she needed to take Holly to a specialist to care for her. Can you imagine the note I wrote to the pastor? Pastor, Jules ate Holly's food and got sick on the floor. Tabitha ate the food off the floor. Now Holly will not eat. Veronica needs wisdom about seeing a specialist. Not sure if you should follow up. (laughs) Seriously. If the Apostle Paul was on the other end of that orange rotary dial phone, do you think that's what the prayer request would have been? Not that I'm the Apostle Paul to any degree. But do you think that's what Paul would be praying for in this matter? I don't think so. In fact, when we come over here, Paul tells us exactly what he's praying. He says this, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. Verse 16. And he says this, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, here's what he wants, would give you a spirit or an attitude or a disposition of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. 
What Paul is saying that he is praying, what leaders want you to understand that what they prayed for for you is that God would do something they could not do on their own. That God would give you wisdom. It says right here, God would give you a spirit, an attitude, a disposition of wisdom. Now, wisdom is different than knowledge because knowledge is the information, but wisdom is the application of that information in the right and proper way. That's what church leaders pray for you. But then there's a second area, that there would also be a revelation in the knowledge of Him. What church leaders want you to get, what they want the church to understand, is they want your mind to be blown open by what the Word of God says. They want you to capture how immeasurably great God is. They want you to see the magnitude of His power, the glory that He has encompassing Him. They want you to see the overwhelming beauty that He has in the gospel, the wisdom that transcends all the wisdom of this day. This is what church leaders want, and Paul is praying here, and he's saying, if the church is ever to grow, it's for the church to capture a disposition of wisdom and a revelation that comes from God Himself so that they may see the things of God. This is what church leaders pray. They want you to know the magnitude of God. And Paul says this. He writes, let me ask this. Ask the church for one another. Do you pray that? In your fellowship groups, is that what you're praying for one another? You're praying for wisdom on to take the knowledge that you've learned in the scriptures and the study of those scriptures and find proper application. Are you praying for one another that the wisdom would be, or that the knowledge would be applicably applied? Are you praying for one another that you might catch the revelation of God through His Word? The magnitude of His Word. Some of us make reading the Bible way too easy for us. You look at the Bible, you read over it, you don't really know what it means. You go find a verse that you like, you underline it, and you memorize it. Or you look at some study notes along the way. The Bible takes work. And what we continually find ourselves is praying this, God, show me who you are. And that's what Paul is writing here. This is what church leaders want. They want you to know first they care for you, Here's the second thing they want you to know. They pray for you. You want to know what the third thing they want is? They want you to know that they aspire for you. They want you to see the beauty that you have in your story. What God has done. Some of you might say they perspire for you. and Maybe they do. But they aspire for you. And I promise you this today, ladies and gentlemen, when you look across, not only from the stage, but you look at your fellowship group teachers, they look in the room and they're not saying that we've got a bunch of just deadbeats over here, bumps on a log. Instead, they see your collective story and they're dreaming with you and for you. Church leaders that love you, they dream for you. I come back here holding Addison in my arms, this precious little girl, much like you dads, look like you've done mom. And you're always like, I wonder what she's going to be like when she grows up. And I wonder how much she's going to cost. A lot, actually. But they're aspiring. You're dreaming. Spiritual dreams and ambitions for your children. Not that they would have some great job. Not that they would find some great mate. Not that they would go live on some adventure. But a parent that loves their child, that cares, that prays, and aspires for their children. You know what their prayer is? You know what they aspire? That my children may know the magnitude of who God is and have the courage to risk their life in following Him. That's what a parent prays. Paul is saying this. He has three foundational truths that he wants the church to capture, wants them to understand. As the church, he's held here. He has three aspirations for them that he wants them to know. And they're all beginning in these next couple of verses with this word, what? Three different times he uses this word, what, to demarcate or to show what he inspire, aspires for the church. I want to show you this. Verse 18, 
He says, I pray that the perception of your mind, or literally the eyes of your mind, may be enlightened so that you may know. Here's the first one. What is the hope of his calling? Circle that word right there, calling, because it goes directly to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul uses this same word. And the calling is not that God has taken us as individual rocks in the concrete of our sin, broken us free, cleansed us with His blood, and placed us in the body of Christ. It's not that calling that he's speaking about. Instead, it's a calling to unity. Let me show you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore I... Prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk worthy of the, here's that word, calling you have received. Same word, Paul uses, draws a line all the way to that. And here it is, the calling of unity. In fact, if you were to read it in the original language, he, he put some plural use and some singular actions. It would sound much like this. Therefore I, prisoner of the Lord, urge Y'all to work to walk worthy of the singular calling y'all have received with all humility and gentleness and patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. There is one body and one Spirit, just as y'all were called. See that word again? To one hope at your calling see that word again one lord one faith one baptism one god and father of all who is above all and through all and in all what paul was praying for the church is that they would capture the unity that comes through the gospel and it's necessary today church that we pray with that same resolve because disunity is so flagrant in our day and it harms the gospel as it harms the church like many of you, Amy and I, before we were in ministry, we were just serving in our local church, and we went through a church split that led to a lot of pain, insomnia, a lot of just hurt. Even our founding church, Lenexa Baptist Church, early, had, early on in ministry, had grown to no more to the size that we were. And on one Sunday... As division had entered in, half the church left. And the founding pastor, Steve Dighton, would share how the church was left with shrapnel and discouragement and pain. He would tell the story how it would take years for the church to heal. But when it did, it grew with a greater resolve that it was going to protect the unity of the church. Even today, ladies and gentlemen, across all of the churches that they've planted, with one even beginning today in Olathe, there are men and women linking arms together, praying for our church that we would be unified. They're not simply praying that we would have the same mind, but they're praying that we would have the same heart to diligently keep the peace and the unity we have because that's what the Bible is teaching here. I firmly believe this, that one of the reasons why our church has such a sweet spirit is because we have remained committed to keeping the unity of the church. We have that resolve, but it requires work, doesn't it? To overlook, and to be patient, to extend grace, to be long-suffering, to love one another with the gentleness that only comes when the gospel is revealed in your life. Over the next several weeks, we'll see Paul unpack this, but I want to say this to you today. When he comes to this second statement that begins with what, he wants you to know that we are united as the church. Here's the third thing he wants you to know, that we are inherited as the church. It says, I want you to know what are the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints. This is all the way back over in verse 19. This immeasurable greatness of his inheritance. You should look at that phrase, his inheritance, with some peculiarity because it is a statement that says that you and I are actually God's inheritance. And we have to ask the question, what does God need from you and I? We don't have that much to offer. 
Why are we his inheritance? And it goes all the way back to the Old Testament, which tells about the Israelite people as God's chosen people, his inheritance, selected by him. But now what God has done through the work of the gospel as he's extended this inheritance, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. And he's allowed you and I to be built into the body of Christ together. And so Paul is praying for the church to realize the great truth that are surrounded here. That you and I, that we're united as the church, that you and I were brought together as inherited as the church. And then there's one final one, that you and I have come to realize that we are empowered as the church. Verse 19, so that we may know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his vast strength. God wants you to know today the vast power of his strength. And he's demonstrated this in the Messiah. Here's where it comes, where rubber meets the road, church. Draw in with me just two more minutes here. What Paul is saying is that behind this temple, this corporate body, in stark contrast over here to the false goddess Artemis, God has taken, he's plucked you and I out. He's placed us in this corporate temple Jews, Gentiles, Jayhawks, and Tigers, all of us are here. While we're here, what we're displaying is the power of the gospel over and over what Jesus has done. And he is filling us with his spirit. So as we're filled with his spirit, we're declaring to the world, to the nations, what God has done. This is what he's wanting us to understand, that he has brought us together. Your leaders, they want you to know that Christ has brought us together. And when it comes down to to it when when struggle comes into your life we're unified together leaders pray for you because they care for you leaders pray for you because they pray for you leaders pray for you because they aspire for you but the question boils down to this for you are you part of the corporate body of Christ or not simply put are you still concreted in your sin with no hope, needing Jesus to lift you out, to cleanse you with his blood, to place you in the body of Christ because you cannot do it on your own? And as we draw in here, this question remains. If Christ is the very one that has united us together, then this church, as I made last week, the statement, this church is not about you or me. It is about his heavenly temple because it is showing his divine work. Do you see this today, church? Do you see what Paul is teaching us? And as we come, we come with this conclusion that Paul has three aims. Leaders have three aims. They want you to know as the church, they care for you, they pray for you, and they aspire for you because they have seen what God has done in and through you. Amen. Will you bow your heads with me?